Hi everyone and welcome to St Andrew's Church Online. My name is Al and I'm one of the associate ministers here. Now as you can see we're still sadly online although we hope very much to be resuming in-person ministry quite soon. Now in this world there's so much that's just out of our control. We know that the weather, the traffic, who our family members are, what country we're born into, all of those things are outside of our control. In fact, most things in life are outside of our control. And we've seen that really vividly over this last year. The whole world has almost been brought to a standstill. Billions upon billions of people have been negatively affected. And when things start to get out of control, it can easily make us anxious, despairing, despondent. We cry out and ask, God, where are you in all of this? But we see just a little bit of that in today's passage. Today is Palm Sunday when we remember Jesus entering Jerusalem triumphant, welcomed by a mass of crowds. But it was just a few days later when he was betrayed, arrested and brutally murdered. How did things get so badly wrong so quickly, we might ask ourselves. Was God out of control? Did he let things get out of control? Well, those are some of the things that we're going to be thinking about today. First, however, we're going to sing. Jesus Messiah, name of all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, a rescue for sin. from heaven Jesus Messiah Lord of all He's been who knew Thank you. 
When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said, and Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, Put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bounded him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. Most of us love a good detective movie, whether it's Sherlock Holmes or Agatha Christie. We love the idea of unraveling a mystery and trying to find answers. We, we want to know why things go wrong. After all, isn't that what a lot of our jobs are about? From doctors giving a diagnosis to lawyers compiling evidence or mechanics fixing a car, we want to find the problem so that hopefully we can avoid it next time around. But what happens when Something affects you personally and you cannot find the answer. What do you believe when things go wrong? Do you say, no matter what happens, I will trust in the Lord? Well, that's easier said than done, especially when you don't know why terrible things happen. In the 1950s, Elizabeth Elliot and her husband Jim were a bright and capable young couple who turned away from the prospect of good careers and comfortable lives to become missionaries in Ecuador. Late one night with other missionaries, they were singing a hymn to God called, We Rest on Thee, Our Shield and Defender. The next morning, Jim Elliot with four other men went out to make contact with a local Amazonian tribe but they were all speared to death. What do you think when things go wrong? Uh, it often becomes easy to, to doubt the goodness of God. You may say to yourself, well, other people don't seem to face the troubles that I've been facing. You might say, well, what have I done to deserve this? How could God allow this to happen? You may even begin to, to doubt the truth of God's words. Now, you may have been in a situation where it's felt as though everything has fallen apart. Or maybe you've always gone through a sense of 
stability and security in life, but that doesn't always mean things will remain the same. So what do you believe when things go wrong? We're in a series in John's gospel looking at Jesus' last night. He's been teaching his disciples and praying with them. And now is the moment that he is taken away from them. Think about what Jesus' disciples will be thinking about in the coming hours. They, they've been with Jesus for three years. They've seen him do incredible things. They've heard him teach astounding things, things where they've said, here is a man who teaches with authority. Here is a man that we can follow. This, is a, this man is the Messiah. Here is the one that God has promised, the king that God said he would send to us. Here is, here is the man who is blessed by God. And yet over the next 24 hours, when Jesus is betrayed and arrested, put on trial and crucified, it will seem like everything has gone wrong. But far from being a tragedy, this passage gives us two simple but significant points to help us move forward with faith and security and assurance. Two points, Jesus' sovereignty and Jesus' mission. We see firstly the sovereignty of Jesus. As Jesus is arrested in this passage, nothing takes him by surprise. All the way through, we see him in control of the situation. This passage was written by an eyewitness. We're told when it happened, after Jesus had finished praying with his disciples. And we're told where it happened, across the Kidron Valley from Jerusalem in a garden that Jesus often visited with his disciples. Jesus knew that he was facing opposition and hostility from the Jewish leaders. A few chapters earlier, we're told that Jesus knew that Judas would betray him. If Jesus wanted to avoid trouble, there was no way he would go to that garden where he knew people could find him there. And we're told from verse two that Judas led a detachment of soldiers into that garden carrying torches and lanterns and weapons. Uh, think about how, how much noise that detachment of soldiers would have made as they approached or how easy it would have been to see them with their lanterns at night, how easy it would have been for Jesus if he wanted to, to slip away and escape. But we're told in verse four, Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, who is it that you want? Think about that incredible statement, Jesus knowing all things that would happen to him. It's a comment that all four gospel writers make about the same situation. It's a comment that's often made about Jesus during his ministry. For instance, when Jesus' disciples were discussing amongst themselves, Jesus knew what they were talking about. Or when the Pharisees questioned him, Jesus knew their motives. Or when he was being jostled by a crowd, Jesus knew when a woman secretly touched him so that she could be healed. Here again, Jesus knows what is happening. He's not a weak and passive bystander at the, at the mercy of his circumstances, Jesus is in control all the way through. We see his incredible control, but we also see that he makes an incredible claim. From verse four, Jesus takes the initiative and he goes out to the detachment of soldiers saying, who is it that you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, I am he, Jesus said, and Judas, the traitor, was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. When Jesus says that phrase, I am he, it's not just a way of self-identification. Oh, you're looking for Jesus of Nazareth? That's me. I am he. No, Jesus is using a phrase which is loaded with significance. In Greek, the phrase is literally, I am. The word he is not there. Jesus is saying to these Roman soldiers, I am. In Exodus chapter three, when, when God appeared to Moses in the burning bush and tells him to go to Pharaoh, Moses says to God, whom shall I say sent me? What's your name? And God said, I am. It's the Hebrew verb to be. When God says, my name is, is just 
I am, it's his way of saying I can't be categorized or reduced down to a simple description. I'm totally and universally present anywhere. I am the beginning of all things. I am the end of all things. I'm not reliant or dependent on anything or anyone. And so throughout the Old Testament, that's used for God's name. But during Jesus' ministry in John's gospel, he picks up that name and uses it to describe himself. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I am, I am the true vine. I am the resurrection and the life. There's this extraordinary spot in John chapter 8 when uh, the Pharisees are, are talking about Abraham and, and Jesus looks straight at them and says, before Abraham was born, I am. He didn't say before Abraham existed, I was, which was, that would have been extraordinarily enough in and of itself. He says, before Abraham was born, I am. He's taking upon God's name, the divine name for himself. It's a claim of divinity and Jesus' opponents knew it. That's why in John 8, they, they picked up stones in order to kill him. They, they thought he was blaspheming by declaring himself equal with God. And here, as Jesus gets arrested, he makes that claim again. Oh, you're looking for Jesus of Nazareth? I am. Now, think about the magnitude of this claim for a moment. In our galaxy, there, there are 100,000 million stars. And there are all sorts of other galaxies loaded with 100,000 million stars. Pretend for a moment that you could do the Star Trek thing and jump into the Starship Enterprise and speed across all these galaxies at, at the speed of light, going past galaxies like their lampposts in a car. And you end up in this far distant place and stop there in the middle of nowhere. Jesus would say that even there he has authority because he says, I am the great I am. I'm the beginning of everything. I'm the author of everything. I'm God who's come among you. Now, listen, we try to relativize Jesus. We say that he's a, he's a great teacher or, or the most compassionate person who ever lived. But, but Jesus won't settle for that. Jesus is saying something that no founder of any major religion has ever said. The founder of every other major religion is a, is a calls himself a prophet or a sage, and they say, I, I've come to show you the way, the truth. I've come to show you the truth about God and how you can live. But Jesus comes along and says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I've not come to show you how to find God. I am the uncreated, beginningless God come to find you. Now, if you noticed, we catch a glimpse of Jesus' incredible divine power because something strange happens here. Jesus is confronted with all these armed men and the Greek word used for detachment is a formal word to describe a troop of Roman soldiers. Here are imperial troops. They're experienced, battle-hardened, tough men, regardless of how you look at it. And yet here is mild-mannered, unintimidating Jesus, this carpenter rabbi who says, I am. And all of a sudden, these armed, tough guys fall to the ground and draw back. Now, remember, they're pagan soldiers, these guys have no idea of the significance of Jesus' term, I am, and yet they draw back and fall to the ground anyway. In the Old Testament, often when people had a sense that they were in the presence of God, they were knocked off their feet. In Ezekiel 1, when a God speaks to Ezekiel, he's knocked off his feet. In 2 Chronicles 5, when the cloud of God's glory fills the temple, the priests are knocked off their feet. When Jesus speaks with these soldiers, before he gives himself over to them and goes to the cross, he gives them a glimpse of his power. It's like he's flexing a little bit. 
like the miracles that showed his power, which gave us a little insight into who he really was, Jesus is doing something which gives us a hint of his true identity and it knocks them to the grounds. Far from being a, a hopeless victim, someone who goes to his death at the whim of his oppressors, here is the sovereignty of Jesus. These soldiers only arrest him because Jesus allows it. And seeing the sovereignty and control of Jesus helps us when we go through difficult circumstances and we ask why. Last Monday, Megan and I had our first COVID jabs and it reminded us of the time when our children had their first vaccination shots. If you're a parent, you might remember the trauma of your children when they're infants, they go to the doctor and it's not just one shot, it's two or three. They get the first needle, it hurts and they cry. And then they see the nurse coming with the second needle and they look at you with this look of betrayal and they say, how could you? I, I thought you loved me, this is awful. This doesn't make sense. What, what are you doing? How could you let this happen? And, and you might speak and say to your child, I know this hurts. I know you're scared and confused. I know you don't understand this now, but trust me, I love you. This is what you need. These shots are what you need. You and I are in the same situation spiritually. The distance between the wisdom of a six month old child and an adult is immense, but it's nothing compared to the distance between your wisdom and the wisdom of God. You know, we often see terrible situations and we can't figure out why they're happening. We're, we're hurt, we're betrayed, we suffer loss and bereavement, and we can't see the reason why these things are happening. And we begin to doubt whether God is actually in control. Maybe God doesn't know about my situation. Maybe he's not aware of my problem. Maybe God's just not strong enough to stop every bad situation from happening. And whenever these bad things happen, maybe you can't see the reason why, but God does. Look at Jesus' situation. He's about to get arrested, have all sorts of false accusations thrown at him. He's about to be beaten, humiliated and crucified. The disciples will look at the cross and say, how could God allow this ha to happen? How could anything good happen from all of this? But what do we see in this passage? Jesus is in control. The disciples don't see the full picture, but Jesus sees the full picture. He knows the pain and sorrow that's gonna come his way. And yet he goes to the cross willingly for us. So what does this mean? Last year, I used this example and it's kept coming back to me ever since. Jim Boyce was a pastor of 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia in the US. And he was diagnosed with a terminal cancer and it ended up taking him fairly quickly. Shortly before he died, he said this to his church, we can pray for a miracle, but they're rare. We pray for wise doctors and effective treatment, but especially we pray that God is glorified because the things that come to us are not accidental. He is sovereign and good. So if he does something in your life, would you want to change it? And could you improve it? We cannot improve what he does. So let us move forward with this conviction. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. So we see the sovereignty of Jesus, but secondly, we see the mission of Jesus. Far from his arrest and trial and crucifixion being something outside of his control, John wants to show us that all of this is the core of Jesus' mission. You can see from verse 10 that Judas's betrayal and Jesus' arrest are too much for Peter. He takes out his sword, lunges at a man, a guy called Malchus, and slices off his ear. You know, on the one hand, you've got to admire Peter because we, we don't know how many soldiers are in that detachment. It could be over a hundred. Regardless, he is hopelessly outnumbered, but still he takes out his sword, defends Jesus, and he's willing to go down fighting. But then on the other hand, it's clear that he doesn't yet fully understand Jesus. 
Because over and over and over again, Jesus had told his disciples that he's going to be betrayed, arrested, put on trial and crucified. Peter might be acting valiantly in bravery, but he's actually physically preventing something that Jesus said would happen. Instead of encouraging Peter or, or, or spurring him on, Jesus rebukes him. He says to him, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? When Jesus said, shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? He's saying something incredible. It's the secret of what's happening at the cross. This cup is a metaphor for God's judgment. In places in the Old Testament, like Isaiah 51, God says to his people, rise up Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord, the cup of his wrath, you who have drained to its dregs, the goblet that makes people stagger. The cup of God's wrath was his settled opposition against evil and injustice, wrongdoing and sin. Some passages proclaim destruction for those who drink from the cup. Others herald salvation for those from whom this cup is withheld. Now, the wrath of God is something that sits uncomfortably to us. It's a psychologically damaging relic from a bygone age. We ask the question, how can we have a loving God, but also an angry God? But sometimes that we, we forget that God's love and anger cannot be so easily separated. Think of your anger when you hear about child abduction or slavery or human trafficking or a father's anger when he sees his child lying or hurting other people or acting in a self-destructive way. When you analyze that anger, you see that it's motivated by love. The more that we have love for the right things, the, the more easily right anger will be kindled, will act in anger to defend that which we love. God loves that which he has created. He loves his creatures. And when he sees that which he loves hurt, ruined or destroyed, he'll act in anger to protect and restore that which he loves. He will act to prevent wrong and make sure right is done. When Jesus says, shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? He's speaking about what is to happen on the cross, how he will take God's anger and judgment against our sin and brokenness. That he will take the cup and drink it. He will take God's anger all of it and drink it to its very last drop. Jesus drinks the cup willingly for us. You might see a little bit further down the passage that Jesus is arrested and taken off to Annas, who is the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest. Caiaphas had earlier prophesied about Jesus that it would be good if one man died for the people. Caiaphas was being politically pragmatic. Jesus was a threat and the Romans might come down because they think he's leading an insurrection. Caiaphas was saying that, hey, we should squash this guy so that the Romans don't come down on us. It's better if he dies and we all live. Caiaphas spoke better than he knew. He was actually pointing to what Jesus would do, that he would take our place. He would be our substitute taking for us the wrath of God, paying our price, bearing our punishment. When Jesus said to Peter, shall I not drink that cup? He could have said to Peter, I shouldn't drink this cup. You should have. Jesus was the only person who ever lived who was completely obedient to God. He didn't deserve to drink this cup. We do. He has every right to turn to you and I and say, this is your cup. This is your responsibility. This is your brokenness, your sin, your wrongdoing, your selfishness. You should drink it. I shouldn't. He should give us the cup, you and me, to hold it ourselves. But instead, Jesus takes this cup willingly so that from the cross, he can look at you and I and whisper our names and say, I drain this cup for you. You who 
deserted me. You who have pushed me to the sidelines of your life. You have lived in defiance of me and offended me. I drink this cup for you. Look, the cross isn't some sort of plan B. Jesus doesn't simply meekly comply to God, shrug his shoulders and, and, and say, well, I guess, you know, God has allowed this terrible thing to happen. No, Jesus willingly goes to the cross for us. He knows what it's going to cost him. And yet he goes anyway. In the other gospels, Jesus prays in the garden of Gethsemane. He says to his father, God, if you are willing, take this cup away from me, but not my will, but your will be done. Jesus knew what was going to happen to him, but because he knows that this is his father's will, it is good. It's like he's saying, this will be horrendous. And yet I embrace it. I embrace it because it's the Father's will and it's for the good of my people. Let me ask you that question again. What do you believe when things go wrong? Maybe you think that God's not in control, that he either doesn't see the bad things that are happening to you or was powerless to stop them. That instead of plan A happening in your life, now you're stuck with plan B or C or D. Maybe you think that God's not completely there for you, that he doesn't love you enough to stop this terrible thing from happening. Maybe in your confusion and disappointment, you begin to nurture bitterness and resentment towards God. A coldness develops in your relationship with him. Or maybe you begin to excuse sin. Because you think that God hasn't been there for you, you do something that you know is wrong and you justify it by saying it to yourself, I deserve this because God wasn't there for me. What do you believe when things go wrong? Look to the sovereignty of Jesus, the one who is in control of everything, the one who knew what would happen to him on the cross and yet went willingly anyway. When things go wrong, when you can't see the way forward, cling to Jesus, the one who bore everything for you. Years ago, when Elizabeth Elliot reflected on the death of her husband, Jim, she said this, they were killed in the course of their obedience. Now, what does that do to your faith? Does it demolish it? A faith that disintegrates is a faith that is not resting on God himself. You've been believing in something that is less than ultimate. You've been believing in your own neat little program of how things are supposed to work. That's just a projection of yourself. And then she goes on to say, God is God. Because he is God, he is worthy of my trust and obedience. I'll rest nowhere but in his holy will that is unspeakably beyond my largest notions of what he is up to. Let us pray. Uh, Lord God, thank you that your son was sovereign and in control. He knew what awaited him at the cross, being separated from you, having the full burden of our brokenness and sin, your anger against us upon him. Lord, thank you that you loved us so much that you gave us your son. Thank you, Jesus, for your love for us, that you went to the cross willingly on our behalf. Lord, we acknowledge uh, that we're not sovereign. We are not God, you are. And so help us, guide us by your Holy Spirit so that in every season of life, whether good or bad, we might walk forward with faith and trust, with assurance, knowing that our security is in you and that you are a good God. Guide us and direct us so that we might walk forward with contentment, even with joy and obedience. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue in prayer as we remember God's love for his people. From 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Lord God, we marvel at Jesus' incredible love for us and his obedience to you in living the perfect life that we should, but are incapable of living out, and also dying the death that we deserve to die because of our sins. We are so thankful that he took the punishment for our sins upon himself 
And we praise you that we are given Jesus' righteousness, something that we cannot possibly earn, nor do we deserve, so that we can be found spotless before God as forgiven people. Do help us live in joyful response to your great love for us to bring glory to your name for all that you've accomplished through the cross. We ask this in your Son's name. Father, for your world, we give thanks for the diverse nation of Nigeria and for the amazing growth of the gospel in this country. We pray for the government that they would be wise and use their resources well to care for the oppressed and marginalized, as well as for effective policies in education, health, and infrastructure. For the church there, please protect and raise up leaders to teach the Bible clearly and faithfully. And please help Christians persevere, especially those in northern Nigeria in light of the threat of Islamic militants and the violence of Boko Haram. We also continue to pray for Myanmar in the aftermath of the recent military crackdown. May there be a peaceful resolution to the tension and might the will of the people be heard. For our city, we continue to pray for the restraint of COVID-19 and its harmful effects on people's daily lives, livelihoods, and literally life itself. We pray for our government, especially Carrie Lam and her cabinet. May you grant her wisdom, integrity, clarity, and diligence in leadership so that resources are wisely and justly used for the good of all people in Hong Kong. We give thanks for the reduction of COVID-19 infections and the gradual easing of social distancing restrictions. Please let this continue further before too long. And we also pray for the safe and effective use of vaccines in the coming months. As for Christians in government and public service, please greatly use them in their work too. Help them be bold and courageous in actively expressing their faith in Jesus honoring Christ and serving others through their words and actions. Finally, Father, we pray for St. Andrews. Even though we are still doing church online, please help us make the most of Easter gospel opportunities and to be creative when it comes to how we reach out to our friends and family during this time. For those in our community and those known to you who are going through difficult circumstances, we pray for your peace, provision, and healing upon them, and for wisdom to those who are ministering to their needs. Furthermore, rather than gritting our teeth and only managing to survive difficult seasons in life, we pray that these might be times when we spiritually thrive. Give us eyes to see beyond the little things in our life, like our individual health and wealth, Please help us to be more ambitious than that when it comes to our desires. Help us seek your glory and your kingdom first so that we would desire your will above our own and find joy in things bigger than ourselves. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us. That's about all from us. Just a few notices as we're finishing. First, giving. Now, we realize that this is a very difficult financial time for lots of people, but if you would like to give to the work of St. Andrews, then you can find a bit more information about that on our website. Second, children and youth. Now, we're gonna take a bit of a break over the Easter weekend, and then children and youth will resume the week after. So just watch out for that. Third, connecting. This is a very difficult time and we just want to warmly encourage all of us to keep on connecting, especially through our online growth groups. Uh, finally, Easter services. Now, our Easter services are such a special time each and every year, so it's with great sadness that they're going to be online again. But these services are actually a brilliant, fantastic opportunity for us to invite friends and being online might be a slight advantage there because we can send people a link and it could be easier to watch online than to actually come to our physical services. So we'd love to encourage us all, keep praying and keep inviting. That's all from us. Goodbye and see you soon.